Death lurks in the shadows of time, often striking quickly without warning, sometimes tugging slowly at life. In our grief and sense of loss, we naturally desire to see our loved ones again. Is there only a thin veil that separates the living from the dead? Can the spirits of the deceased cross Mom? over into our world Mom, to give us guidance you? and comfort in this life? Yes, sweet darling, it's me. I've been watching over you, honey, and I see that you're going In to the sacred really pages good. of God's Word, the truth about this mystery is revealed. Join us as seminar speaker Steve Orberg presents Deadly Delusions About Death and Hell. And now the feature presentation, Should We Talk to the Dead? The topic that we are going to be studying about tonight and throughout uh, this weekend in some ways is a painful subject. Uh, it is controversial. It is inevitable. It is necessary that we understand it. And it is my hope that as we get in uh, farther on that it will also be enlightening and that it will be encouraging and comforting. Uh, we don't want to just, you know, deal with controversial topics, but we want to uh, comfort people's hearts and lift them up and inspire them. And that's the reason why I want to focus on this text before we have a prayer. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 105. 119, 105. The Bible says, this is David praying a prayer, and he said, your word, talking to God, your word is a what? It's a lamp, right? God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And sometimes this world can get pretty dark. Wouldn't you agree? Pretty dark. And we need the light of God's Word. Uh, it's, it's a light in the darkness. And as we get farther into the meeting tonight, I want to go to the Bible. I'm going to take a look at a number of Bible passages. I want you to know right from the very beginning that I am a, a believer in this book. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God's Word. And I believe it is the uh, full authority, the final authority, the ultimate authority of, of truth. And so that's my conviction, and I hope to uh, prove various things from the book as we go on into our meeting. And as I mentioned, it's painful, controversial, inevitable, necessary, and the topic has to do with, with death. I think it was Benjamin Franklin, I know it was Benjamin Franklin, that made the famous statement that there's two things that we cannot avoid in life. What's the first thing? Taxes, that's right. And what's the second thing? Death, that's, that's correct. There's no way around it. And so uh, tonight we're going to start tackling this subject because it's inevitable. It's something we all have to face at some time or another, uh, death. Now we're going to move beyond death as well, and especially tonight we're going to talk about the uh, phenomenon, the movement of quote-unquote talking to the dead. Should we talk to the dead? Is it really the dead? What does the Bible say about that? That's what we're going to go into tonight, moving beyond the, the grave. The title is there on the screen for tonight, Should We Talk to the Dead? Let's bow our heads. I know that Pastor Dale has prayed, but I always like to pray before I speak. So if you wouldn't mind, let's just pray again and ask uh, God to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. I'm a believer in Christ. And I think hopefully everybody here is, maybe not, I'm not sure. You know every heart. But we just pray that you will help us, that you will take charge of this meeting, that it will be one that brings light and, and hope to people. It's going to be uh, in some ways a difficult weekend as we get into a very powerful subject, emotional subject, and we just pray that you will help us. Please help me as I lead out tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. I always like to start out with prayer. Well, it is that time of year again. We are now in November, and we have just passed another Halloween. Trick-or-treat night. A lot of things associated with Halloween. Uh, it's no secret that Halloween is an extremely uh, expensive holiday, if you've done a little research on this, from what I've learned is Halloween is next to Christmas as the most expensive American holiday uh, throughout our year. The most recent uh, statistic that I read was 6.9, get this, billion dollars spent by Americans on costumes, parties, decorations, and treats. 
Uh, it's also no secret that Halloween is definitely associated with death. Uh, all you have to do is walk around neighborhoods and look at what's on houses and around houses and on the front lawns at that time of year, and it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, my wife and I live in Paso Robles, and we have a little, little baby boy named Seth who's now 15 months old, and, and we were walking around our neighborhood, and we could see the hands coming out of the ground. We could see the, the tombstones that say, rip, and the cobwebs, and, you know, some of the figures were really ghastly. The ghosts and the ghouls and the skeletons, and uh, all of these, you know, dark type of scary things. I think we had somebody actually knock on our door. A number of kids actually knocked on our door, and we decided to give out some uh, Tootsie Rolls and some tracks about Jesus. So the kids didn't know it, but they were trick or tracking at our house. We gave them a trick, and we gave them the tracks. And anyway, our little boy was uh, standing there at the door a couple of times, and some people came with some very scary costumes. And Seth, you know, I guess he's not old enough to know what's frightening yet, and he just looked and smiled and thought it was kind of neat. But uh, they were actually pretty scary. So uh, why is Halloween associated with, with death? You know, why are there all these death things that are happening connected to this holiday? Well, it's, it's not hard to find out if you do some research, if you go on the Internet and type in Origins of Halloween. Uh, you can find all kinds of different articles. It actually goes back to a, a people called the Celts, the Celtic people who moved into the area which is now the British Isles uh, over 2,000 years ago. They were a people of the land, and many of them were uh, pagan people, and they had priests, a priestly class called the Druids. And as you study history, uh, this really was their holiday. And it wasn't originally called Halloween. It was called, and if I can pronounce this correctly, Samhain, Samhain. Uh, it's not spelled like it sounds, but that's the, that's the way it's pronounced. And it was an ancient Celtic holiday. Samhain basically means summer's end. And their philosophy was a long, long time ago that basically what they did was they divided the year into the light part and the dark part. And the light part was the, the, the time of the growing season. You go into spring and summer, and that's the time when the, the plants grew and the sun was shining and uh, nature was thriving. That was the light part and which they associated with life. And then there was the dark part of the year. And the dark part was, was moving into the winter months when it got cold and the crops didn't grow. And they believed, and this is a Celtic belief, that the transition day from the light part of the year to the dark part of the year was November 1. That was the day, from life to death in their yearly cycle. And so they began to celebrate a, a special ceremony, or, or at least in honor of, of that day, and they connected it with the spirits of the dead. And when, Now, what they believed was on, on the night before November 1, at the end of the summer, when you moved into the death part of the year, as they said it, uh, they said that the veil between the visible and the invisible world was very thin. The veil was thin. And they believed that the spirits of those that had died in the past could easily go through the veil and they could roam the earth, which they believed they were doing, roaming the earth, uh, especially the night before November 1, that night. And some of the spirits that broke in through the veil and came into this, this life weren't the friendliest spirits. They were sometimes uh, pesky or actually rather sinister. And so they developed a, a number of customs. And one of the customs was in the Celtic villages that the kids would, would run around and they would dress up in very scary costumes that had to do with death. And, and darkness and skeletons and things like this. And in their minds, they believed that these kind of uh, scary clothes could scare away the spirits. So they wouldn't come to them and they wouldn't attack them or try to possess them. And sometimes they would try to soothe the spirits and they would put little offerings in front of their houses so that they would be nice to the spirits or other times they would just try to scare them by wearing their scary clothes. And so that's, that's the ancient origin of how it happened. And then it developed down throughout, down throughout history. In the 7th century AD, uh, the, the Roman church decided to take the, the, the day, November 1, Samhain, which was celebrated by the Celts and which was connected to the spirits of the dead coming through the veil into this world. And what they decided to do was to change the day 
to a new name, and instead of honoring just the dead or associations with the dead and the spirits of the dead, they decided to make it in honor of the dead saints and the martyrs who uh, they believed had died for, for Jesus. And so they changed the day, November 1, to a day called All Saints Day. All Saints Day. And then they decided to name the night before that day. Let's see who knows some of the history. What's the name of the night before All Saints Day? Okay, All Hallows Eve. Right, just wanted to make sure you were uh, up there or up on these things and thinking about this. Good, a lot, of, a lot of you know that. Right, they named it All Hallows Eve. So you have All Saints Day preceded by All Hallows Eve. And somehow, as time went on, uh, the words were combined and it became known as Halloween. The uh, festival was really brought over to America in the 1840s by a group of Irish immigrants who had a crop failure, a potato crop failure. They came to America, they brought it with them, and it slowly worked its way into American life and now it has become the second biggest holiday of the year outside of Chris Christmas, one of the most expensive, one of the mo ones where Americans spend the most money. And it now has all kinds of different uh, streams running into it. You've got the, the Celtic stream, you've got the Roman church stream, you've got the commercial stream, and all these streams come together, come together in Halloween. In Mexico, anybody know what they call it in Mexico? The day of the what? The Day of the Dead, right, the Day of the Dead. That's what they call it uh, south of us. And so it's definitely connected to the dead and the spirits of the dead, no matter how you look at it, whether it's just a consumer consumer thing where kids just dress up like that because they're, you know, they want to have fun or, or whatever. They're you know, just going out and picking, picking up candy. But it is associated with the dead, the spirits of the dead coming back through the veil the night before November 1. Now, this whole idea... I felt it would be good to give just a little overview because this is the time of year that we just passed through. But this idea of communication with the dead or having the spirits of the dead pass through the veil and come back, come to this life, is certainly not just a, a Celtic idea. Uh, it, is, it is an idea that is growing rapidly on many fronts all around America and around the world. Somebody handed me this just tonight. This is an issue, this is actually yesterday's issue of the Fresno Bee. Here's the Fresno Bee, I don't know how many of you get the Fresno Bee. I don't because I'm not from around here. But anyway, this front cover here shows a group of people at a cemetery putting things on, putting food on various graves. And here's the paragraph down below I just wanna read to you. It talks about a woman here who's pictured in this picture. And this woman believes that the spirit of her mother floats back to earth to visit her at St. Peter's Cemetery in Fresno. She is not the only one who expects wandering souls to mingle with the living on the grassy ground. So uh, it wasn't just the Celtic people, but there's a lot of people today, like it says there, she's not the only one, and I wanna share a lot of things because this is really, uh, as I said, getting bigger and bigger all the time. Uh, I've done a lot of research about a movement that is called Wicca. Wicca witchcraft, or it's Wicca is a movement composed of people that practice witchcraft. I've written a different book, one of my books called Hour of the Witch. And because I have written this book and I've actually ordered certain books on Wicca uh, from certain websites, I've gotten on a mailing list and they send me their journal. Uh, this is their journal here. It's called New Worlds. Sometimes you, you know, think Christians should be um, more faithful in following up on people that are interested in what they have than they, than they are. But anyway, this is the October issue, 2005, of New Worlds. And this journal is put out by an organization called Llewellyn Public Publishing, Llewellyn Publications there in Minnesota. They are the biggest occult publisher in the world. They publish a lot of books dealing with, uh, with witchcraft and Wicca. And for those of you that are up on this, the Wiccan movement is growing very, very rapidly right now on high school campuses, on college campuses. If you go onto walmart.com and just type in the word Wicca, uh, you'll be amazed at what you find. And anyway, this particular journal talks about uh, witchcraft, and there's a feature article here called Where, Where the Spirits Speak. And when you just turn the page to the first page here, it has a list of 
various books, and I think they put this together right for the Halloween season because the title here says, When the Nights Are Long and the Veil is Thin Between the Visible and the Invisible World. And here's a series of books, and I'll put one of them up on the screen. This book is written by a man named Constant, Constantinos, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and you can see the book there on the screen. It's called Speaking with the Dead. And the paragraph that talks about this book and promotes it says they are waiting, disem disembodied voices from beyond. Phantom faces caught on video, a clear presence in a seance room. Far more than the stuff of supernatural fiction, these real experiences await, await you. The author of Speak with the Dead has been experimenting with reaching out to the spirit world for over a dozen years. He has had amazing success with every technique described. His simple step-by-step -step instructions show you how to use ordinary electronic devices like tape recorders, video cameras, and computers to make contact, record ghostly phenomena, and even establish a two-way live communication with the spirit world. And then it gives all kinds of... Uh, benefits to getting this book and how you can reach out and you can talk to your to your loved ones. Here's another book I didn't mention called Becoming a Medium. Um, actually, that's the subtitle here, and it, the book is called How to Communicate with Spirits. So that's just an example. So it's not just the ancient Celts, but modern the modern Wiccan movement is also focused on communication with the spirit world very strongly. I have a friend of mine, her name is Pam. She used to be in, into the Wiccan movement. She came out. She's no longer a Wiccan. And she emailed me just recently and she said, Sawin is coming. She said, pray for me. It brings up a lot of memories uh, concerning her life and her past and some of the things that she has dealt with that have really, uh, she thought were friendly, but they became very scary to her. And so uh, I prayed for her and she made it through and she emailed me after the holiday was over and she was just uh, talking about God and about the Lord and how he was still encouraging her in her life. But anyway, that's just, an, just a, a small example. Now, many of you are probably, in fact, I would say all of you, are familiar with the Harry Potter books. The Harry Potter books are the most popular books ever written for kids. There's nothing like them. They've sold... Uh, millions and millions and millions and millions of copies. The, the last book came out just in just last July, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, and I believe they sold about seven million copies in the first 24 hours. That was book six in the Harry Potter series. The final book is still on the horizon. It's not out yet, but it's coming at some point in the future. Uh, I've done a lot of research in the Harry Potter series. I've written my book, Hour of the Witch, uh, showing what I believe to be the, the connection between the Potter books, even though they're fantasy, and the growing Wiccan movement. Kids read books that are fantasy, and yet many times, not all the time, but many times, it creates an interest in checking out the real thing. And the real thing is out there growing all around uh, by leaps and bounds. Well, anyway, this is the second book in the Harry Potter series called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And on page 156, there's just a little scene here where Harry is in the, is in the bathroom of a school for witches that he goes to called Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and he is talking to a young girl that used to be a student at Hogwarts, but she died, and now her ghost inhabits the bathroom. And this is just a little scene described here where the girl's name is Myrtle, and she's talking to Harry, and this is what she said I, in this book. She said, I wish people would stop talking behind my back, said Myrtle in a voice choked with tears. I do have feelings, you know, even though I'm dead. Now, most people think these are just fun fiction, you know, storybooks that nobody needs to worry about, but I want to tell you in this fun, supposedly fun scene, uh, this is talking about, you know, a very common practice these days of communicating with the dead. And it's right here, and this we could call this uh, spiritualism. That is spiritualism, and it's just being described here, uh, right there in book two. Here's another one, and I'm just giving you a survey tonight. Before we go, as we get near the end, we're going to look at the Bible. But at the beginning, I'm just going to give you an overview of what's happening in our society. The Celtics, the Wiccan movement, the Harry Potter series, people gathering uh, around tombstones in cemeteries. This is this week's issue of People magazine. There's a picture of a man there smiling with a glass of, uh, looks like, wine that's bubbling over. And the title here says, They See Dead People. They See Dead People. And there, this is a, an article about a number of people that have spirits of the dead living in their homes, they think. 
and they have some kind of a friendly relationship with them. And these people are smiling and, and happy because they're, they get a kick out of this, actually. Here is a picture of the cover of a movie that came out not too long ago, produced by Hollywood called White Noise. Not too long ago, my wife and I and, and our little baby were on uh, our anniversary, and we were staying in a hotel in Monterey, California. And one night, we had some free time, and, and it was dark, and we decided just to browse through the, uh, the options of the programs that were made available by the hotel to see if there was any family-friendly shows. And so we were browsing through, and there was one picture of a, of a man with his, uh, his son, and it didn't have any description, it didn't have any preview, and it looked like a family-friendly film to me, so I thought, okay, we'll give it a try. So we pushed the button, and within minutes, it was showing up on our TV screen, and it was white noise. Well, we watched it for about 10 minutes, realized what it was about, and that was it. And I'm glad that uh, when I went to the front desk, they gave me my money back, because it was not something that we wanted to watch. White Noise is the, it's a, it's a movie about a woman that dies, and she begins contacting her husband. Her husband is walking along one day, his cell phone rings, he looks down there, and it's his, it's his wife's caller ID coming into his cell phone. And that was about the end of that we saw, but as I've learned more since I've done some research on this, uh, and there's a website that promotes this movie, that this is actually more than just a movie. It's connected to a real-life phenomenon that is called, for short, EVP, EVP, uh, Electronic Voice Phenomenon. And what happens is there's a whole movement connected to white noise, and there's a lot of people out there, and if you go to the website, which I don't really recommend, it will actually tell you all about this phenomenon and how those that have died are actually able to communicate with the living through giving messages through the white noise that comes through your, your tape recorders. Any kind of electronic recording device that you have, whether it's video or audio, they believe that you can set it up in a certain way and you can you know, go through certain things and that those that are on the other side can communicate with you and give you messages uh, right there on your, your recording units. And this movie is not just a movie, but when you go on the website, it's actually promoting this activity uh, and it's growing across the country right now. So there's a lot of people that are getting into this. Now, here's another Hollywood TV series came out earlier this year. Uh, on the NBC network, and it's called Medium. How many of you have heard of Medium? Have you heard of Medium? Many of you have, and there's just a little clipping or a, a picture there of the, the lady that plays the woman that is a medium in the series. It's about a woman, and it's actually based upon a true life, true life story of a, of a lady that worked for the state and is involved in uh, solving crimes, and one of the ways she solves crimes is by seeing things, as it says there, that others can't see. She is able to see those that have passed on to the other side, those that have, have died. Now, here is the, here's a picture of the woman. Her name is Alice, Alison Dubois. She's a real live woman today. This is the story of the woman who inspired the NBC television series Medium, and this is airing right now uh, on, on NBC. And there's a picture of the real lady, and her book is called Don't Kiss Them Goodbye, and it's all about communication with the dead, that when they die, they're not really dead, they're out there, and you can still make contact with them, or they can make contact with you. So this is Hollywood again, based upon something that is, that is really happening. Many of you probably heard of this, this was another NBC series, supposedly a Christian series that came out earlier this year called Revelations. And if any of you saw Revelations, it was really being promoted as something that would help you understand the Bible and the book of Revelation and the time of the end, capitalizing on the interest that Americans have right now and people around the world have on the apocalypse and on end time events. And I was shocked when I saw some of this series to see that the part of the storyline, the main part of the storyline was a woman, uh, a, a young girl actually who died and she went on to the other side and her spirit was now communicating through another girl who was in a comatose state and through this comatose girl the previous dead girl was giving messages to the living about the end of the world 
And there's a couple of people that were just, you know, trying to track this and trying to find out what is going to happen at the end based upon this. And it was all spiritualism. You've got another girl, you know, on the other side communicating through a comatose girl giving messages. So that's Revelations. Now here's another one. And it is also about a woman that can talk to the dead. So Hollywood is really getting into this, really focusing on this. And this particular picture there, it mentions uh, a Halloween seance. Now, the co-executive producer of this, of this TV series is a man named James Van Pra. And there's his picture up there. James Van Pra is one of the most famous mediums today. He is really big. He's really well-known. He's written many books. And he decided to have a Halloween seance right before Halloween online where people could log on to a CBS website and they could spend about an hour with him where he would do readings for them and he would find out about their loved ones that had died. And, and so here's another example of a Hollywood series that is connected to real people who are really doing this. Really doing this. Medium is based on a real woman who's really doing it. Uh, Ghost Whisperer, this man, is the co-executive producer behind the series and he's doing it. And there's other people that are doing it. Uh, here is a picture of John Edward. He's, a, I think, probably James Van Pra and John Edward are probably the two most famous mediums today. They're, they're big, they're out there, they're on the radio, they're on TV. Uh, they've been on big shows like Oprah, Larry King Live. I mean, they are out there. And here's uh, one, of, one of his books, After Life. Uh, this man has just gone all out along with James Van Pra. Now, as I've been doing research on this, learned about another lady, and she's an upcoming medium, and there's her picture right there. Her name is Carla May. This girl was raised, a woman was raised a Baptist, and now she's gone into mediumship. And from what I read, uh, she has a new TV series that's just about to hit, and it's called Messages. Carla May, here's a clipping about her. It says, much like the highly praised TV show Medium and Ghost Whisperer and John Edwards crossing over, Carla May connects to people's deceased loved ones on the other side. She has recently been selected to host her own TV show, Messages with Carla May. Her line is, we don't die, we just cross over, just like uh, John Edwards' line. And she charges 90 bucks for a 30-minute phone session. These people are getting rich on this. As the People magazine article said, uh, some of them are buying second yachts because there's a big market out there. Now, it's not just in the Hollywood arena. It's not just in the Wicca arena. It's not just described in a funny way in the Harry Potter series. It's not just going back to the Celtic roots. It's not just in society at, at large. But most of you are familiar with the apparitions of Mary and how this has moved into the quote-unquote Christian world in the general Christian world and it has crossed over and there's just a whole lot that could be said about these apparitions. These are also voices from the other side. Supposedly Mary is showing up all around the world in different places and she's giving messages to different people. I have a book here called Thunder of Justice. It's a Catholic book and it describes uh, these apparitions these miracles written by Ted and Maureen Flynn, forward by Malachi Martin, uh, who's now dead, very famous uh, Vatican professor. And anyway, this book claims to document appearances of Mary uh, around the world that she is giving messages also from the other side. Here's another photograph of a book called Mary's Message to the World. The woman that wrote this book, her name is Annie Kirkwood. Uh, she's a Texas gal. And she started receiving messages in her head from the Virgin Mary, someone she thought was the Virgin Mary. And the messages told her she needed to go public and tell the world messages from the Blessed Mother. And here's just a few of the statements that are in this book. On page 280, Mary, or somebody that professes to be Mary, told Annie to tell others that there is no devil. That's one of her doctrines. Another one on page 195 is that heaven and hell are simply mental states. It's not real. And another one on page 84 and 85 says, in one lifetime, Joseph, who was Jesus' earthly father, uh, was a monk. We have all lived many lives. So here, Mary, or whoever it is, is teaching uh, reincarnation. Now, I don't know how many of you, I imagine most of you are probably pretty familiar with your Bible. 
But are those teachings up there what this book really says? Does this book say there's no devil? Does this book say there's no heaven or hell? Does this book say that uh, reincarnation is, is true? No, it doesn't say that. This book does not say that. And so whoever this spirit is, this apparition is, this voice that's appearing uh, or speaking in, into this woman's head, it is certainly not a voice that is lining up with this book, with the Bible. The veil is getting thinner these days, and it's not just around Halloween. The veil is thin all around the world, and it seems to be happening with increasing rapidity on a variety of fronts all around us, whether it's Hollywood movies or TV series, whether it's real-life mediums who are actually on television and seek to communicate, say they can communicate with the dead right there, whether it's people visiting cemeteries, whether it's New Age journals like uh, New Worlds, people that are involved in Wicca and witchcraft, we are seeing a, a phenomenon that is happening all around us and it seems like it's, a, it's on the increase. It's on the rise. I've never seen, I don't watch a lot of television. I, I used to, before I became a Christian, I was really big in TV. I actually worked in the movies for a little while in the summer of 1979. But when I became a Christian, I left all that. God brought me out of the darkness of Hollywood. He brought me into the light of his book, into the light of Jesus. So I'm not a big TV watcher, but I do research because I speak on these things. I want to be dealing with things that are happening right now that are big in the world and that Christians need to be aware of and think about and talk about and deal with from this book. And that's why I'm aware of these kind of things. And it's just very clear to me, uh, especially as I look at what's happening now, that there has never been a time that I'm aware of where NBC and CBS and various networks are coming out with more programs that are dealing with spiritism and talking to the dead and mediums and these kind of things than right now. I mean, something is happening in our society. And it's not just Hollywood, it's the real thing. It's the real thing. The people that are behind the programs are doing it, and they're promoting it, and they're trying to get other people to do it. And that's what we're seeing happening all around us. And probably one of the biggest reasons why this is happening is because, well, maybe I should say one of the reasons. I'll go to Revelation and show you what I think is the biggest reason. But one of the reasons is because death is still a very painful event, one of the most painful events that anybody can go through. I think somebody once told me divorce is worse. Going through a divorce is worse than having someone die because you live the horror after a divorce. When someone dies, at least um, it's easier for many. And Hollywood is taking advantage of this. And when people lose a loved one, it hurts, doesn't it? Uh, we suffer over these things. I remember when I was maybe 10, first funeral I ever saw was my Uncle Manuel. And I remember going and seeing him lying there in the casket. And looking at him and trying to figure this out, you know, he, he looks totally different. He's cold. He's motionless. His face is white. He's laying there in a, in a box. You know, what is this all about? Now, if I was older and if, he was, if we were very close, I'm sure this would have, a, have affected me more. But it does, affect, it does affect us. It affects us all. Anytime you lose someone that you love. Uh, I'm thankful that my mother and my father, although they're getting up there, they're still here with us, <laughs> with me. And I'm not, you know, looking forward to having to deal with, with the day of their death. It's painful. And it's also natural. It's the most natural thing in the world when someone dies to wish they were still here if you love them, right? You want them to still be here. And it's a natural thing to wish that you could talk to them. Now, this is a rather funny slide I'm going to show you, but it illustrates what people are trying to do. There it is. It's a man trying to, you know, he's in a cemetery, he's got his phone, he's dialing up, hoping that he could find somebody on the other side that he loves. Uh, it's a common practice. People are doing it, and they're doing it more now than ever before. Now, uh, before I get into the Bible, I want to share something with you that the public is not being told. When you, if you ever watch any of these, and I don't recommend you watch James Van Pra or John Edward or these mediums that are on TV talking to what they believe are real people on the other side, Certainly don't recommend that, and I'll tell you why in a few moments. But anyway, if you do, 
most of the time, it looks really friendly. You know, it looks really positive, just like this picture here from People magazine of this man. He's smiling because he sees dead people. But what the public is not being told, and what certainly isn't expressed here, is that those who get into this, many, many, many times, things turn very frightening, extremely frightening, uh, more frightening than, than we can imagine. There is one particular woman, and I'm just going to use her as an example, and there's a picture on the screen of a book. She, this woman is dead now. Her name was Jane Roberts. Jane Roberts, prior to James Van Pra and John Edwards, was one of the most famous mediums in all of history. And this woman lived in the, in the 1960s and the 1970s in New York, and one night her and her husband were playing with the Ouija board, and this spirit started communicating with them, who eventually said his name was Seth. Seth, and I, I hate that because that's the name of my son. <laughs> but my son's named Seth because the Bible talks about Seth. Seth was somebody who, he was actually the uh, son of Adam and Eve after Cain killed Abel. And in the Bible, he was a good guy. But in this particular phenomenon, Seth was not a good guy. And if you do some research on this, there's, there are millions of people today around the world that still read Jane Roberts' books. Seth, and there you can see a quote from him, he said, I do not have a physical body, yet I am writing this book. And if you just do any research on the internet, type in the Seth material or the Seth books, there are a lot of them out there. I have a friend of mine named Tal Brook. He's the president of the Spiritual Counterfeits Project, very well-respected evangelical author and speaker. And he's written a book called The Mystery of Death. He's a friend of mine. We email each other regularly. And he has done a lot of research on this woman, Jane Roberts. And that particular book right there, they changed the cover. They changed the cover because the, you can't see this here, but the old cover of the book, Seth Speaks, shows a picture of Jane right on the cover there, and it is a ghastly picture. It's very frightening. And Tal has done a lot of research about this woman and about Seth. And when she would go into a trance, Jane Roberts, a deep masculine voice spoke through Jane. Uh, she, Jane acknowledged a sense of great power in Seth's voice. This was not, this was not trickery. This was real. Uh, one time she was in, Jane was in her bedroom, her, suddenly she became aware of a dark looming figure menacing her. It tried to kill her and she screamed. She was terrified. Uh, and, and it was Seth. Well, the next day Seth said that it was just a product of her imagination, her own evil being projected. It wasn't really from him. And this book describes the frightening things that this woman went through. She was eventually analyzed by a, a well-known psychologist who interviewed Seth directly to see if Jane Roberts had a double personality. And it was the opinion of this psychologist that Seth had, quote, a massive intellect. He was a very powerful being that was not a figment of her imagination. Uh, he, this, as Tal Brooks writes, this Seth creature finally produced 5,000 typewritten records through Jane Roberts, which are now in print, and that people can be reading um, all around all around the world, and that's what they're doing. And if you just look at the life of Jane Roberts, you will see just one example of the many, many frightening things, scary things, uh, horrifying things that happened to her as this being who said he was Seth, someone from the other side that was coming back to enlighten mankind, how he was doing uh, horrible, horrible things to her. Not things that any of us want to be involved in. Now, let's open our Bibles up. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, it's time to look at the book. As David said, God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let's look at verses 9 to, 9 to 13. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. And this is God's book. This is what God has to say about all this. The Bible says in verse 9, and this was God talking to the Israelites before they went into the promised land. He said, when you have come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. The things that the nations around them were into, God said, don't get into those things. Don't do them. Verse 10 says, there shall not be found among you anyone 
who makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. This was a pagan practice. If the kid survived when he went through the fire, that pleased the gods. If he got burned up, then they wanted him as an offering. Terrible practice. And then it says, or who uses divination. And I'm reading the King James Bible. Or someone who is an observer of times. That's astrology. Or who is an enchanter or a witch. Verse 11 says, or a charmer or a consulter with what? Familiar spirits, right, talking to familiar spirits, or a wizard, and the King James says, or a necromancer, or a necromancer. Now I'm gonna push my button here and show you what the New King James says, because this is a easier translation in this verse. It says there, or a medium, or a spiritist, that's where it talks about the familiar spirits, or one who calls up the dead. A necromancer is someone who tries to communicate with the dead. That's what it is. And the New King James says, one who calls up the dead. Now notice verse 12. It says, for all who do these things are what? An abomination. All who do these things are abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God does drive them out from before you. You shall be perfect before the Lord your God. So how does God feel about calling up the dead, trying to communicate with the dead, being involved with familiar spirits, being involved with mediums and things like this. What does God say? Is this something we should be doing? That's the title of our meeting tonight. Should we talk to the dead? According to this book, according to God, what does he say? No. No way. Don't do it. Don't get involved in it. And I'll tell you the reason in just a few moments. Here's another verse up on the screen, Leviticus 19.31 says, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards. Now, the New King James translates the word wizards as medium. Medium. Same thing that's the title of the NBC series, medium. And God says right there, to be defiled by them, I am the Lord your God. Don't go after these things. Don't be involved with this. Don't get uh, caught up in this. Now, turn to the book of Job. Turn to Job chapter 7. Job is right before Psalms. And take a look at chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Job chapter 7. It's happening all around us, and yet this book says, don't do it. Right? Don't get involved with familiar spirits. Don't try to contact the dead. Whether it's through EVP, or going to a medium, or whatever method or means somebody comes up with. Seance, Halloween seance, on cbs.com, any of this kind of stuff. God says, stay away from it. Now look at this verse, Job chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Job was, uh, God considered him to be perfect in his generations. Job was a righteous man. And this is what Job said about death. In verse 9 and 10, Job said, as the cloud is consumed and vanishes away, so he that goes down to the grave, someone that dies and goes down to the grave, says, shall come back and talk to you. Is that what it says? No, it says, he that goes down to the grave shall come up no more. Shall come up no more. Now look at the next verse. Verse 10 says, he shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. So God says that when a person dies, he doesn't come back to his house. There used to be a lady that used to uh, clean our house. Her name was Mary, and Mary told me personally, she said that when her husband died, she was in her bedroom, and she looked through her screen door, and she saw her husband. And her husband walked right through the screen door, right into her bedroom, and began to talk to her. Was that really her husband? Not according to this book. This book says that when they die, they don't come back to their house. I have another friend of mine named Paul, and he told me that before I became a Christian, his girlfriend died, and this girl actually came back to him. She appeared to him and gave him a hug and a kiss. And later on, when he studied the Bible, he realized that that was not his, his girlfriend. Uh, the Bible is very clear, and there's the verse right on the screen. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. So we already read tonight, God says, 
Don't get involved with these spirits. Don't try to talk to the dead. And this verse says the dead aren't going to come back to their houses. So if the dead go, don't come back to people's houses, then who, pray tell, are these spirits that come back to people's houses? Who was it that walked in to uh, my, my friend Mary right through the screen door in her living room? Who was it? What was it? Who was it that uh, spoke to Jane Roberts, that, that Seth being? You know, who was that? Well, let's go to Revelation and take a look at chapter 16, verse 14. Let's find out. Revelation 16, 14. 16, 14. And this is the reason why God tells us don't do these things. Don't get involved with them. It's not because God doesn't want to comfort us. It's not because he doesn't want to help us or heal us or nourish us. It's because he wants to protect us from forces that are out there that people just don't know what they're dealing with. They are dealing with things that are very powerful, like that psychologist who analyzed Jane Roberts when she was in her trance-like state. She said that being inside of her had a massive intellect. He was extremely powerful, uh, not a figment of her imagination. In Revelation 16, verse 14, this is a key text. Notice what the Bible says. It says, they are the spirits of what? The spirits of devils, right, working miracles. The devil can work miracles too. The Bible talks about God and the devil. It talks about the light side and the dark side, the good and the bad. And on the good side, in the invisible world around us, there is uh, the Holy Spirit and there are good angels. And we'll talk about that before we're done. In the invisible world, there's the Holy Spirit and there are holy angels. But there are other spirits that are out there, fallen spirits. And the Bible here calls them the spirits of devils. This is uh, Lucifer and his angels, Satan and his angels, who are down here in this world right now. They're in the invisible world. They're out there. They're extremely tricky. They can work miracles. And it says they go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 15, Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. I'm coming quickly. And then he says, Blessed is he who watches. And, and this, does, this doesn't mean watching medium on TV. It means watching out for deception. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And that's what happened to Adam and Eve when they yielded to the subtle serpent. They lost their robe of light and they knew they were naked and they were, they were ashamed. And then verse 16 says, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue. And what's that word? The word there is Armageddon. That's right, Armageddon. Now, if you look at verse 14, 15, and 16 in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, God's last book, he tells us that there are, there are going to be spirits of devils, spirits of demons, some translations say, that are going to go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the final battle against God. And the battle there is on the screen. It's called, it's called Armageddon. And as I look around at what's happening right now, as I look at the fall lineup, on NBC and CBS, as I look at these popular mediums and more on the horizon, as I look at movies like White Noise and EVP and, and all these kind of things, uh, even the Potter books that seem to be so funny and friendly, planting seeds in kids' minds that you can communicate with the dead, that the dead still have feelings even though they're dead, just like that ghost in the bathroom. Uh, all of these things are part of a, a bigger picture. They're part of a master strategy. They're part of a master plot of someone the Bible calls Lucifer, whose name was changed to Satan. He's now the adversary. He's the leader of legions and legions and legions of fallen angels that are out there in the invisible world, and their goal is to trick, to deceive, and to, and to destroy. And according to Revelation, we're going to see a buildup of the spirits of devils that are going to be going on around the world as we get closer to the Battle of Armageddon. And that impresses me strongly that we're getting close, don't you think? Uh, we're seeing it, it's happening around us, and wow, God wants our eyes to be open. And the reason why he tells us, don't talk to the dead, don't get involved with these things, is because he wants to protect us, and because they're not the dead. Satan is very subtle, that's why they're called familiar spirits. They look familiar, they talk familiar, they act familiar, they know things that nobody seems to know, unless it was them, but it's not them. 
It's the spirit of devils. It's Satan and his, and his angels. Now, go back to Revelation chapter 5. And before we finish this meeting, I want to... I've done a lot tonight. I've gone through a big survey of what's happening in the world right now. Then I've looked at a number of Bible verses that God doesn't want us communicating with the dead or even trying. They don't come back to their house. These are the spirits of devils. God says, stay away from them. But now I want to look at the other side, at the bright side, at the positive side, that out there in the invisible world are not just evil spirits impersonating the dead. I don't want you to leave tonight and, you know, be scared to go home and go to bed. Uh, I want you to realize that there are good forces out there, and they're much more powerful than Satan's forces. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. Same book of Revelation that warns about the devils. Chapter 5, verse 11 says, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels around about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. There are more angels on God's side than are on Lucifer's side. There's about a third of the angels that got kicked out of heaven a long time ago that went with Lucifer. Two-thirds went with God. There's more good guys than bad guys. There's more holy angels than rebel angels. And God's angels are stronger than Satan's angels as well. And I like the verse that's up there on the screen. Psalm 34, verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. This verse shows us that God's angels, what are they doing? They're encamping. Now, when I was a kid, and actually still today, when I have a chance, I, lo I love to go camping. When my little boy gets a little bit older, we're going to go out and, you know, I'm going to buy him a little backpack. And we're going to go out there and we're going we're gonna to hike and do some camping. And I like this verse because it says God's angels are campers too. They camp around us. And notice it says, who do they camp around? It says they camp around them that fear him, those that fear God, those that honor God, those that trust God, those that believe in God, those that reverence this book. Uh, I, I'm not going to go to any medium or spiritist. My dad used to do that actually before he became a Christian. He went to a medium, and this, this person went into a trance, and a spirit spoke, and he said his name was, was Jock. It wasn't Seth, it was Jock, and gave him a guidance for his life. Well, when my dad became a Christian and started reading the Bible, he didn't go back to listen to Jock anymore. And, and I don't go to these, those people. Uh, I, I want this book. <laughs> I want God and his angels. And I don't go to bed at night afraid. I'm not worried. I'm not scared, even though I'm dealing with the subject. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a little nervous because it's just so big. Uh, I'm not afraid of these spirits, come what may, because God's angels are more powerful, and they're going to surround us, and they're going to protect us. And I really believe this with all my heart, that if our eyes could be open right now, we would see legions and legions of holy angels all around this place. I have another book. This is one of my favorite books. I like this book. This book is called It Must Have Been an Angel. I don't know if any of you ever read this book. It's by Margie Lewis Lloyd. And this book is a documented book about all kinds of people that have had encounters with angels. God's angels, not the evil angels. And there's one story I really like about a woman that was, uh, she was an old lady and she lived in a cabin way out in the country and her friends would come and during the winter they'd help her, you know, cut wood and give her wood for her fire. Well, one particular winter it got really cold and she ran out of fire. She didn't have a phone and her friends didn't come and she was cold. She was getting colder and colder and colder. And she prayed, dear God, please uh, help me out here. I need your help or I'm going I'm to die out here. And well, anyway, a little while later there was a knock on the door. And she said, come in. And a tall man walked, walked in, a very tall man, noble-looking man. She'd never seen him before with a pile of wood. And he didn't say a word. He just walked over and put the wood on the fire and then walked out. A few minutes later, he walked back in with more wood, went over, put it next to the fire, and walked out. He did this a couple of times. He packed the wood, and then he got the fire going, lit it, and then he began to walk out. And she sensed he was walking out for the last time. And they didn't, she, he didn't say anything, and she didn't say anything. She just watched him. This is in this book. It must have been an angel. And as this man was walking out, this tall, noble-looking man walked out for the last time. She looked at him, and in her mind, just in her mind, she didn't say it out loud, in her mind, she said, are you an angel? And this man turned to her before he walked out the door. He looked at her, he smiled, and he went. He nodded, and he walked out the door. And uh, she got up and she went over to the door, you know, and she looked out and there was snow on the ground and there were no footprints in the, in the snow. 
none. He was gone. And that was one of God's angels. And God has lots of angels all around. And those angels will be around us, and they will protect us if we fear the Lord and trust in him. Last Bible text. Let's go to Romans chapter 16, verse 20. We will close with this verse. Romans 16, verse 20. This is a great text. I've emailed this verse to people before to encourage them in the battle with the forces of darkness. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. This is what the Bible says. That the God of peace, the God of peace shall bruise Satan. Some translations say crush. He will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. God is more powerful than Satan. His angels are more powerful than Satan's angels. And if we trust the Lord, if we're on his side, if we follow the Bible, if we stay away from the things of darkness and follow Christ, God has promised that his angels will surround us, that he'll protect us, he'll take care of us. And just like this uh, slide here shows a, a mother holding on to her little baby, praise God, he will hold on to you, and he'll hold on to me. And we don't need to be afraid of these forces. I heard another story about a little girl once. She was like five years old, and she was af afraid of the dark. And uh, she was living just with her dad, and one night she went to bed, and it was scary, and she said, uh, she got up and went out of her bed, and she said, Daddy, Daddy, can I come in and sleep with you tonight? I'm scared. And finally he said, okay, you can come in. So she got in bed with her, with her dad, and uh, the lights were off, and she was still scared. And then she said, Daddy, Daddy, she said, uh, in the darkness as she's laying there, she said, Daddy, Daddy, is your face toward me? Is your face right next to me looking toward me? And he said, yes, dear, my face is toward you. It's okay, go to sleep. And she went to sleep, had a good night's sleep because she trusted in her father's love. And isn't that good? And that's the way God is. Trust him, trust his love, trust his goodness. His angels are powerful. And one of these days, Jesus is going to break through the clouds and he's going to come down here and he's going to get us and he's going to take us home. And we don't have to deal with these things anymore. But while we're here, we still have to deal with it. And so let's know what the Bible says and let's be on God's side and follow him 100%. Doesn't that sound right? Stay away from the darkness. Don't get involved in those things because they're dangerous. God wants to protect us and preserve us through his forces who love us and want what's best for us. Let's bow our heads and let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for, for this meeting. Thank you that I've been able to be here to share these thoughts with this group. And we pray in Jesus' name that powerful angels will surround us all just like the angels that sang at the birth of, of Jesus Christ on the plains of Bethlehem. May holy angels surround us and camp around us so we don't have to be afraid, we don't have to worry about evil spirits or uh, Satan's angels. Please, Lord, bless us and help us to know our Bibles and to know what's happening in our society so we'll be on your side all the way until the end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.